this is probably one of the, of the most foundational parts of um, of the presentations. I'm sorry, uh, it's okay. Here we go. This is one of the most foundational um, parts of our debate is to level the playing field for the discussion groups uh, on how we perceive national interest, policy, and strategy. And uh, Dr. Uh, Luca, my good friend Dr. Luca, before me, um, already uh, has shown you all the concepts, and as we didn't have the, the opportunity to, um, to debate beforehand, uh, I mean, in the previous weeks, my presentation basically follows the same uh, kind of rules that, that he does, although with a different presentation. But the point is not so much the concepts in this case. Uh, the point here is that the experience that we can take from how we look at it, these concepts, this is what can uh, teach us something, teach us to look to ourselves and to develop the, pro develop the process of creating a national security strategy in our own countries. What do I mean with this? I mean, I am not going to repeat what doc Dr. Luca just said. That would be extremely boring after lunch. I'll go into practical examples. For instance, Dr. Luca's country is a, a relatively new state, not necessarily a relatively new country. Mine, uh, I'm, I'm from Portugal, it's the oldest state in, in, in Europe, um, not by age, but as the same state, nation, and people with the same frontiers, we are the oldest in Europe. And in our experience, which is almost the opposite of yours, we have exactly the same first three national interests for the last 600 years. This morning, someone was questioning, how do we give continuity to a strategy with a change of government? That's not very important. What is important is for everyone in a country to understand what is the interest of that country. In our particular case, and it differs from country to country, for the last, again, 600 years, our first three priorities are the Atlantic, Africa, and Europe. The order sometimes changes. But in an absolutist monarchy, in a liberal constitutional monarchy, in our first republic, in the 46 years of dictatorship during the 20th century, in the democracy since 1974, regardless of which government is in power, from right or left or center or coalition, we always have these three interests. Now, again, not trying to conceptualize, because Dr. Luke already done that brilliantly, much better than I could ever, but going down to examples, how does this translate into policy? Well, let's take, for instance, Africa. For a long time, for Portugal, as we didn't consider ourselves truly European, we are very far away from Paris and, and from, from Berlin, for us, going to Europe, still today, amongst my colleagues, we usually say, should we go to Europe as if we were not part of it? Pretty much like the United Kingdom. We are kind of the United Kingdom of the South. But, uh, there is a point here, which is, we use, usually, usually uh, looked at Portugal as a global country. Our strategic area of interest was not Spain, too strong, France, too strong. It was the African continent. It was the South America. It was Asia. This defines what national interests are. So when you think about interests, don't think about, you know, who's in government, who's the prime minister, who's your president. He will die for sure. What in national interests will you leave to your kids that they can also say, these are also my interests? That is the important part of it. 
it doesn't matter if I'm from right or, or left, if I'm Republican or, or uh, monarchist. I'm Portuguese, and therefore, I see my own country as a country that is global in its interests. I have much more affinity, and uh, I have colleagues here who I hope share the same interests, with uh, in Maputo or Luanda than I do in Paris or, or London or even Madrid. It's who we are. The question to make when you refer to interests is, who are you? That should guide the way in which you find interests. It's not so much regarding South Sudan. How will you come out of uh, um, becoming an independent country? No, that's, that's not the point, as you know very well. The point is, what do we, we South Sudanese, what do we want our country to be? Like forever. That is the key. But regarding policy, and again, to go down to examples, because this facilitates the way we, we try to explain uh, the issues. Take Africa. For some centuries, the priority for Portugal was Africa, much higher than Europe. We only went to the European Union in 1985, so it's a very, very, very uh, uh, new thing to us. Um, but until 1974, our interest Africa was pursued by a policy of colonial war. We waged war in what we would call Portuguese territories in Africa, overseas territories, by waging war against liberation movements. Now, it is a very unique empire, if we can call it that, because as you all know, in the, in the particular case of Portugal in 1974, the liberation movements in, in Angola, in Mozambique, in Guinea-Bissau, to say just a few, but yes, also Cape Verde, and also St. Man Principe, um, were brothers in arms with the opposition to our dictatorship. So these guys, Portuguese from Portugal, from current Portugal, and Portuguese from Angola, were brothers in arms in Algiers, in Moscow, in Paris, in, in Washington, in London. So after 1974, it was the same brothers in arms that went into power in Lisbon and in Luanda. So it's a very different relation from the French or the, the English traditions. We are unique in that sense. We keep on being brothers throughout the difficulties. But my point is not that. That's just history and we can, can be perceived differently. The point is, even after the end of a policy, not interest, of a policy of waging war, as the interest kept on being Africa, it was pursued with a different policy. A policy of cooperation, a policy of helping each other developing. Because mind you, Portugal in 1974 was a very poor country. My mother went barefoot to school and only until fourth grade. And this was current Portugal in not so long ago. Again, again, again my mother. It's not three or four generations ago. What should we take from here? Interests, policy, strategy. Strategy should be the easiest thing to do, right? Because the really dr the, the driving force of all of these are interests. And if we take one interest, let's use a country who's not in the room, uh, so there's no uh, misunderstandings about it. Santo Man Príncipe, two small islands in the Gulf of Guinea. What's Santo Man's interest? They can still choose, for example, it's for them to know, not for me. If they want to be a naval power in maritime safety and security and have, for instance, maritime courts at the regional level, like it's happening in, in, on the other side of the continent with the Seychelles up to a point and Mauritius to another. Or they can opt to be like, like some Caribbean countries that are uh, financial offshores. Depending on those two very different interests, they will pursue very different policies. Either they want to have a judiciary which is highly specialized in maritime piracy, in fishery, in international law, yada, yada, yada. Or they want to have very good accountants, very good tax laws, yada, yada, yada. So again, before we go down to concepts, and we've done all of that with Dr. Luca, 
let's think who we are. How do we see ourselves in our nation? That is the important part. Because today you have a president and tomorrow you have a king and the other way around and now it's this and that. Oh, no, no. In my particular case, the regime is very stable and will keep on being like that forever. No, because we are all humans and we all die. So the regime will change in every single country in this room. So it's not important if the government changes, if the regime changes, for interests. It is important as far as policy is concerned, because policy is the way that the current leadership sees the application of that interest. Again, using the Portuguese example, interest, Africa. The dictatorship would think we should keep uh, the, the overseas territories and therefore wage war. And the democratic regime said, no, we support the liberation movements. We want to develop together in cooperation. But the interest is the same. <coughs> now going slightly down to, to uh, national security strategy. It's common here to say that um, national security strategy is ways. I would say in Portuguese, and I beg your pardon to the translators, there are two traditions, caminhos or modos. Sorry, you can, you can keep it on English. It is just specifically for, for Portuguese because as you uh, heard in the morning, Dr. Malakias said that in Portuguese, policy and politics are the same word. He is right, but not entirely. This will be very tricky for the interpreters. I'm so sorry. In Portuguese, policy can be translated by public politics, políticas públicas, which is very different from politics. <clears throat> Why do we say it like this? Because politics has everything to do with regime, with political parties, with cover current government. But when we, at least in Portuguese, put the word public uh, pol uh, politics, which translates into English into policy, we are saying that it's from the, the entire community. That it is the way in which the administration carries out, again, those policies, that vision from the leadership, into actionable actions. I'm going conceptual again, like Dr. Lucas, so I'll go back into examples because it's much easier. If we take that Portuguese interest about Africa, and if we take the, the dictatorship approach to policy, which was war, they should, as far as the strategy is concerned, develop a defense industry. That's exactly what happened in Portugal. We had a strong defense industry back then. These days, with another figure, uh, another, um, sorry, another concept that <coughs> exists in Portugal and somewhere else, which is the, the strategic co national concept, uh, we say that one of the main goals uh, that we should have as far as uh, our own security is concerned is economic stability. Therefore, if regarding our role in the world, including Africa, and our capability of financing cooperation, of investing, of having a global presence, we should bet on our capability of financial um, uh, endurance, let's put it this way. Therefore, it is a priority for Portugal not to have a defense industry, but to have a stable currency, in this case, join the euro. And you'd say, but how can one thing be the same as the other? It is supporting defense industry, on one hand, to wage war, or have a stable currency like the euro to have cap economic capability to project our interests abroad, abroad are exactly at the same level when you consider how you see policy and strategy. So, how far does this go? Because I'm giving examples too easily and there is a limit to this. There is a point in which strategy ends up influencing policy and, in the end, politics. How? 
If you think about um, the concepts that were uh, spoken about this morning, about human security and citizen-centric uh, security, you end up opening your minds to everything, to economic security, as I just said, to financial security, thank you, to financial security, to health, to development, to education, to food security. Does this translate into the same ways, the same strategies? No. In Portugal, we don't see our defense sector as having to have an active role in food security. The defense, not the security. But for instance, in Mozambique, the defense forces of Mozambique have special units to produce food because that is essential for Mozambique. So even the concept of food security differs from country to country. There is a line to be drawn. And that line is when the strategies that we conceive end up influencing not only policy, that's normal. Again, to have that military unit producing food, you do have to have the resources, the means to create uh, up to a point a security sector reform to have the units that do that. But there is a limit. When it influences not only policy, but politics, when the state becomes too centralized so as one man can give or take away food, health, education, and so on, and so on, and so on, that is a little bit too much of human security, at least for my taste. That endangers the pursuit of national interests, because there will be a confusion between the guidance from the leadership, policy, and the national interests, regardless of, regardless of who's leader, national interests. And I'm open to, um, to questions with one last comment. It was also said here that one of the problems with, uh, um, with strategy is the classification. Is it secret? Is it open? I would say that the problem is not so much the classification of such a document. The problem is legitimacy. We are very much used to hide our threats from our neighbors. Gentlemen, ladies, the world has changed. These days, it's almost impossible, there are obviously exceptions, but it's almost impossible to have unilateral action and alone. You need interoperability. You, you need the agreement either of the UN Security Council or of your neighbors or work in, the, in joint, joint ventures of some sort or the other. So the problem here is no longer to hide your threats, is to share those threats. When you say to your neighbor that you have an internal threat, he legitimizes you to act upon those threats. So up to a point, and counterintuitively, it is a very good thing to share our national security strategy with our neighbors.